Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, please. The three places, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 4, and Romans 1. Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and Romans 1. You will want to have those handy because we'll be working through these three passages fairly quickly today to answer the question, what is idolatry? And we'll see how these three passages help us fill out our answer for today. And uh, we'll put the answer on screen so that we can see it and say it together at all three campuses. Here we go. Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the Creator for our hope and happiness, significance, and security. It's replacing God's rightful status as capital C Creator by putting our faith and trust in any created thing or person or idea or belief or institution or vision. It's putting our heart's ultimate longing and desire in the stuff of this world in a way that delivers for us to replace and function in a way that delivers for us what only God can actually do and satisfy, which is why we call it idolatry. This brings up a lot of fundamental questions like, what do I really worship? Who do I really worship? What do I really worship? Who or what do I serve? Do I give my life to? Really? Where am I failing to glorify and thank God for His provision for me? To whom or what are my energy, my money, my time? To whom or to what are those resources of my life directed in a way that keeps me from being satisfied in Him? And then what are my hopes and dreams that are replacing God's vision for my life as revealed in His Word? Now, idolatry is so fundamentally part of our sin that the Bible doesn't really speak of it just as if it's one sin among other sins, but it speaks of it as the first primary root sin which is why God revealed it very early in the Scriptures, even in the first chapters of Genesis. Today we're going to start in Exodus chapter 20, because right on the heels of delivering the people out of slavery in Egypt, God Himself, in very explicit terms, God Himself writes down the first two of the ten. He writes all ten, but He writes down the first two commandments about idolatry. And then He speaks it, so that they can hear it. That's how seriously God takes idolatrous worship of anything other than Him. Jump in at Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. And notice that it's in quotes, God speaking. You shall have no other gods before me. Now notice, notice that a warning against idolatry is present here in the very first commandment. No other gods before me in front of me, in place of me. No other gods can be first, which is really an amazing thing because not only is he saying no other gods before me helps you, but it's just a fact of reality that I am the only God. There are no other gods. You can't actually have another God before me. I'm the only God, which means I'm the only God you can actually have. It's a statement about God alone being holy and worthy of worship and service. And then the second commandment begins to flesh this out in a bit more practical terms. Look at verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, typically handcrafted wooden figurines, though they certainly would have had idols that were made of fancy metals. But you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. Notice the words image and likeness. They're reminders from the first chapters of Genesis that God created humanity, all of the beasts of the field, as it says, all of the birds of the air, all of the fish of the sea, all the things that we see around us that our creation were made by God, which is an important element that we'll see throughout these three passages, that God as Creator, capital C, 
worthy of worship, creation not. So, he says, don't make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. Also important to see here is that any likeness begins to expand beyond carved images to speak of any form, any manifestation. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of, verse 4, anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So, so no likenesses, no forms, no manifestations of anything in creation anywhere. Ending in verse 5a, first little section there. In verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. God himself, writing it down with his hand, Scripture tells us, saying it to Moses... And then we see a number of places that it makes clear that he was saying it so that the other people could hear. God himself saying, watch out for this. Watch out for this. Because this is, this is a big, big deal. This is a root cause of sin. So don't give your heart to anything, anywhere that would endanger giving your worship and service to me alone, God says. Now, soon after Exodus 20, after the giving of the Ten Commandments, Israel had failed to enter the Promised Land. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses is encouraging them to trust in God's power by reminding them of what had just happened and what God just said at Sinai. And what I want us to see here in Deuteronomy 4.15 is that Moses begins to add a little bit of detail that helps us see why God warned against idolatry in the first place and why it can be such a problematic and even hidden temptation. Jump in Deuteronomy chapter 4 at verse 15. Moses speaking says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. And here's why idolatry is a thing at all. Since you saw no form, meaning you saw no form, on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, it's another word for Sinai, same thing, you saw no form out of the midst of the fire. Meaning is that since God the Father is a spirit, John 4, 24, Colossians 1, 15, 1 Timothy 1, 17, if you want to bury in me on that. Since God the Father is a spirit, and he had no form when he spoke to you at Sinai, then, verse 16, second commandment, Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal on the earth, any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps in the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. So because you can't see God the Father, there's a sense in which it's only natural to seek out something tangible. If you give your heart to the likeness of anything, which would make sense as a temptation since God the Father is a spiritual being and doesn't have a form that we can look at and touch. In other words, because God's not a man, He has no form. And because our senses are the primary way we take in information and we experience reality, the natural temptation or maybe even the fleshly thing to do is to seek out tangible, touchable, sensible truths about this spirit that we can't see. It, it, it makes sense that we would look for something that can be manipulated, made by human hands. And the ultimate danger that we'll see in Romans 1, something that can be made into what we want Something that can be made into what we want. Something that fits with our heart's desires to satisfy us apart from God. This warning continues in verse 19, Deuteronomy 4, where Moses alludes to the first commandment, but with a bit of an idolatrous uh, application, an idolatrous tweak that helps us see another important aspect of idolatry. He says this, Beware lest you raise your eyes to the heavens, to the heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the hosts of heaven, be careful lest you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them, serve the created order. I mean, 
They are amazing. The things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven. This is a way of saying that everybody gets to enjoy God's gift of creation, which is true. Everybody gets to enjoy God's gift of creation. But, but God, through Moses, is saying here, don't settle for just that, but rather make sure you are bowing down and serving the Creator Himself. Creation is not meant to be worshipped and served. It's meant to point to the one who is worthy of worship. So this is a really important part of what comprises idolatry, this distinction between creator and creature that's expanded upon in Romans 1. We see an upending, an exchange, as Paul will say, an upside-downing, of God's intent for creation that is idolatrous worship and in the end rebellion against God. Starting at Romans 1, verse 18, where we're just looking for the upending of God's creation intent that is idolatrous worship and eventually rebellion against God. It says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, meaning it is being justly revealed from the fullness of God's glory, because He's holy. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven, and is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, as a category for humankind, who by their own unrighteousness suppress the truth. They push down the truth in their sin. And so now, in verse 19, we start getting some hints of idolatry. It says this in verse 19. For what can be known about God is plain to them. What can be known about God without God's revelation of Himself in special, specific terms like Jesus, like the Word of God? Well, what can be known about God is plain because we can see creation, because God has shown it to them for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power, His divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Because the power, the, the divine nature that has to be there in order for creation uh, to happen is itself pointing to a capital C creator. So, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature, nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So, they, everyone, is without excuse. Because the function of creation is, yes, to keep us alive and to be resources for our ongoing even joy and experience of enjoyment. But creation itself is ultimately meant to point to a creator worthy of worship. So this idolatry of the upending of creation becomes explicit starting in verse 31. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. It's a violation, when you think about it, of the first two commandments. We'll also see a violation of the first two commandments in verses 23, 25, and 28. Paul obviously reaching back to God's intent for creation, saying, idolatry means not honoring God and not giving thanks to Him in a way that upends God's intent for creation. Keep reading. Although they knew God, they, do not, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile, empty in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, he says, and here's apparently what fools do. They exchanged, key word for us here, we'll see it three times and it's important, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God, meaning the God who does not die because he's holy and he has all power, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, not all powerful beings that do die because of sin. Exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And then here's the result. With exchange, God gave them up. It happens three times which is, a, which is a key for us of seeing 
the upending of creation that results in God giving them up, giving them over, allowing the consequences of that rebellion of idolatry to have their results, exchange the glory of God for images and creeping things. Therefore, verse 24, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So, exchange followed by God giving them up happens in verses 23 and 4 that we just looked at, verses 25 and 6 in just a sec here, and then 26 through 28. This is Paul pointing out that the essence of idolatry and God's response to it means, go ahead, worship creation. See where this leads. So, keep reading verse 25, which not only starts another exchange and God giving them up cycle, but it also states very clearly the upending of God's intent for creation that is idolatrous worship that is also rebellion against him, says in verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship served the, create, the creature rather than the creator. The lie is to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. For the record, under the category of creature is humanity. The expanding of the idea that it's just birds and animals and creeping things and ancient pagan handcrafted wooden idols is being expanded upon in a number of places in the New Testament to say anything. To worship and serve the creature rather than the creator is the essence of idolatry. So, Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up, there it is again, to dishonorable passions. Now from this point all the way through 31, through verse 31, Paul begins to detail the miserable results of idolatry. And what idolatry does is it, it continues to pervert God's intent for creation. It continues to turn into what it is. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, which yes means what you think it means, as does verse 27, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up, which is the third cycle of exchange. God gave them up. When you exchange the glory of God, who does deserve worship, for anything that doesn't, God gave, gave them up, gives them up. So since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled, which is language for saying the completion of, the fullness of. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And then in verse 32, this is where idolatry ultimately ends up. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Meaning, <laughs> idolatry is not only refusing to give honor and thanks to Him that He is due, it ultimately means attempting to steal that honor for self. It's a, form of, it's a form of abuse of God's gift of creation that's meant to point to Him as worthy of our worship so that it will serve us and our purposes in a way which is ultimately not just this idea of upending creation, though it is that. It's not ultimately just an idea that we worship the created things or 
anyone in creation in a way that is in the end rebellion against God, though it is. But it's those things because idolatry is always ultimately about the attempt to steal in vain the glory of God for self, which makes the idol you. Always, ultimately, this is what idolatry leads to. Which is why God takes it very seriously. So three takeaway thoughts for us today. And then we'll end with a a question. Idolatry is not simply one sin among many. We talked about that a bit at the end, uh, at the beginning. (laughs) We're at the end. Idolatry is not simply one sin among many, but it's kind of a root sin, a meta sin, um, because it reveals the ugly condition of our heart and the selfish trajectory of our desires. It's not just one sin among many sins. It's ultimately at the root of all of our sin, and it's meta because it goes throughout our sin. It goes through all of our sin is at the root of and somehow integrated into every other sin. Because when we idolize anything or anyone, we are showing, we're revealing that our hearts are still desiring things or people other than God Himself as if He cannot satisfy us. Now, the point of number one is just kind of simply to give us a a diagnostic, a way of thinking about how idolatry applies to all of our lives. So, So think about it like those questions we asked at the beginning. What really, who really do I worship? Who am I really bowing down to and serving? Where am, I, where am I failing to glorify and thank God for His provision? To whom or to what are my energy, my time, and my money? To whom or what are my life's resources directed in a way that keeps me from being satisfied in Him alone? And then finally, what are my hopes and dreams? What are my hopes and dreams that are replacing God's vision for my life as He has revealed in His Word? You you don't need to go somewhere else for the vision for your life. All of that detail will take care of itself, even as it is hard, (laughs) even if there aren't answers. Your vision for your life starts... And acknowledging that God as creator made you for his purposes, and that's the only reason you exist at all. That you came from DNA, from your parents, and yada, yada, and, you know, you have people in your past that are the 12th signatory of the Mayflower Compact like I do. That you have some great pedigree literally means nothing in terms of understanding that you were created for God's glory. Every once in a while, my parents would say, listen, we we Wakefields don't do that. That's just not what we do. We Wakefields, we care about yada, yada. And I'm sitting there as a young teenager like, yeah, yeah, I know, we Wakefields. That was true, and I'm glad they said that. But that you exist at all is because God is giving you the opportunity to say, we worshipers of the Lord, we servants of Christ, do this this way, say these things this way. Because our mouths, our bodies, our talents, our minds, all of it is meant to be directed to the glory of God, and we find our joy and satisfaction in that vision. Number two, idolatry is not simply an eventual problem, 
but it is by definition a now problem in your life. Even if you've known Jesus for a long time, it's, it's a now problem somewhere, somehow, in relation to something or someone, which means all of us need to see it, to name it, to understand how we are being idolatrous in some form or fashion. We need to see it and we need to take it out by the roots at the bottom to do war against our own sin. Friends, the problem with idolatry is not simply that our hearts are given over to someone or something other than God such that eventually it becomes an idol. I think that's like how we like to talk about it. As if the sin to avoid is not eventually becoming enamored with that thing or person, which is true. If we don't yet have an idol of something, we should keep it from being one. Duh. But in the Scriptures, I, idolatry is definitionally anything or anyone that is functioning at all to replace God's rightful place as Creator and Lord. So it involves any way that we're doing so. And it's not just those evil pagans out there whose hearts are turned against God's glory in some form or fashion. It's all of us in a way that we are seeking to find our hope, our happiness, our significance, or our security in anything or anyone that inordinately depends upon that thing or person. Idolatry is a form of messiahizing things or people who cannot possibly bear the weight of that dependence because they, like you, are sinners. It can be that vocational goal that you're obsessed with. It can be that personal ambition that drives you more than anything else. It can be that personal vision that ignores God's vision for your life. It can be that, that thing that you didn't have when you grew up with so that you want this for your kids that drives you in a way to create family memories that means you are not worshiping and serving God and acknowledging Him as only as only he deserves. In fact, it's that boyfriend or that girlfriend, it's that husband, it's that wife, it's even that beautiful baby or all your now grown, formerly beautiful babies that you still nonetheless idolize. Don't for a second think you can't possibly be the person whose heart is somehow misdirected, even in your relationships with those who are closest and you love the most. Wherever you see it, root it out. Ask the Lord to show you and to help you. Read His Word to learn a vision for your life that comes from Him. And do battle against the perverted desires of your heart. Don't sit like a lazy bump on a log like most Christians think is an okay way to go through life. If you love the righteousness of God given to you by the grace of God on the cross of Christ that earned for you a salvation that you couldn't for yourself, if that is true and you actually believe that, then you understand a need for grace that means you are continuing to love God and do what He calls you to do, to become who He's created you to be. An idolatrous worship of anything or anyone around us will keep us from growing to become who God made us to be. Number three, idolatry is not simply refusing to honor and give thanks to God, but it's an abuse of creation for self that attempts to steal from God's glory and claim it as your own. And only by admitting your idolatrous worship of self and placing faith in Christ can you be restored to His good purposes for you. I think we need to stop deceiving ourselves and thinking that God made this world for you and for our sakes. These things we call our own, this money that we earned, 
this house that we live in, the cars we drive, the kids we have, the talents, the abilities, the mind, these technological tools, they're all given to us to be properly used for the sake of pointing to His goodness and glory. So stop, stop deceiving yourself into thinking that this world is made for you and it's made for your sake. Stop messiahizing people around you as if they exist for you. Stop stealing the glory of God by being a selfish, egocentric, idolater of creation in ways that show that you are actually an idolater of you. You see, friends, idolatry, idolatry, it isn't just don't worship those empty pagan idols. Check. It's not just don't upend creation and worship the created things. Check-ish. Not really. It's all the ways in which our hearts try to find their satisfaction apart from God that is a form of us trying to find our satisfaction in ourselves. Idolatry is always and ultimately about looking at the world and thinking about the world as if it's, as, as if it's after our image and for our purposes which is why God takes it very, very seriously. And friends, there's only one way to recover (laughs) from the idolatrous worship that is rebellion, that is idolatry of self, that is a selfishness and glory hogging and abuse of God's creation. There's only one way to recover. There's not another way other than admitting, (laughs) admitting the idolatrous worship that replaces God's glory. by trusting in Christ. You see, when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, we are admitting that we are sinners who need His righteousness. And when we do that, when we trust Him, when we put our faith in Christ, it restores His rightful place. It's us admitting we can't and saying, only you can it's admitting that we, we are the sinners who need His righteousness, and that restores His rightful place as the only immortal God whose perfections and holiness deserve all of our hearts and all of the glory and all of the honor. That is the beginning of living for the joy of seeing Him glorified and worshiping Him as He deserves. And if you're an idolater of self, friends, lay your sins of self at the cross. At the cross that restores you to the God you've offended by your worship of self. Why? Because He alone has grace for that sin. Let's end with this one takeaway. Well, it's three takeaway questions. <laughs> what one thing, what one thing are you giving yourself to that most endangers your love for the Lord? And what's the most important thing that you can do to reset your heart on his glory? You see, friends, that's the only way you can get to the joy you seek. As it actually turns out, God's not just some human, sinful, envious, jealous, super powerful human in the sky. He actually deserves all glory. Which means (laughs) when we reset our heart on His glory, we find our satisfaction in that. 
That is how we become who he called and created us to be. And then finally, when you've thought about the one thing you're giving yourself to that most endangers your love for the Lord, and the most important thing you can do about it, who are you going to tell for accountability? If you're serious about rooting out your sin and admitting that you can't make it on your own and that you have to have the perfect, sinless, righteous life of Jesus for you that then worked as atonement for you on the cross. If you're serious about giving your heart to the Lord, then do something, tell someone. You'll probably find they need you to. Because I would think they've got things too. Let's pray, friends. Lord, we are given to lesser things and empty pursuits and sources of significance that can't possibly deliver on the promises. The trajectory of our hearts has so often been temporary, mindless, empty, and small satisfaction. So we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be people who admit before you that we can't make it without your goodness and glory being lived for us in Jesus in a way that restores us to relationship with you. Father, that's an amazing grace and we have to be satisfied in you and in that grace alone because we recognize that you've made us for you and we failed to live as you deserve. And we're grateful that you make of us people of grace who can live in ways that are increasingly pointing to who you are because of your son Jesus. Help us, Lord, to witness to that truth so that others would see and find satisfaction and joy and peace and rest in your forever presence. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.